Hey, this is Tyler with TJX Survival. I'm here with a friend of mine, James. Who are you, Mr. James? I'm James. Um, I'm a retired 18 Delta, which is a Special Forces medic, also a 18 Echo, which is a Special Forces Communications Sergeant, and I own a company named FP Tactical. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit today about the differences in gear choices of what a soldier or a Special Forces soldier would make versus what a civilian would make. So stay tuned. So James and I uh, met years and years and years ago. Um, I can't remember if it's in a military school or whatever. We were in the same unit for quite a long time. And we're talking um, about the, the misnomers that civilians or the average population has about soldiers being like super survival experts. So <laughs> while we were talking about that, um, I really wanted to kind of clarify, I, I guess you gotta define your terms first. I look at survival as doing anything that you can from primitive skills to uh, soldier skills in order to survive a situation like a car wreck in the mountains or a plane wreck or a shipwreck or something. And while soldiers are obviously very, very good at surviving in a combat situation, they're oftentimes not as good at surviving in a primitive living skill situation. So there's definitely a very big difference between the two, wouldn't you say? Well, I think the most important thing to realize is for a, for a soldier to survive, he's been separated for whatever reason from his organization, and his goal is to repatriate himself. So it's in and out as quickly as possible, get back to your people. Whereas the primitive living situation is, well, you're out in the wilderness staying there, yeah. <laughs> now what do I do? Exactly. And Obviously, the primitive living skills will help a soldier that's in that situation. But if you ever watch Dual Survival, I think it's kind of interesting because the soldier is always like, let's go, 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 go. And the hippie, for lack of a better term, is always like, no, this is nice. Let's hang out and let's make a tree house or whatever. And the skill sets, the skill sets carry over. Um, but also in this video, we want to talk a little bit about why a soldier would pick certain gear versus a primitive living skill survivalist would, I'm gonna have to call that an acronym, PLS. Sounds good. <laughs> no. So a primitive person would pick different gear. So we're gonna talk a little bit but, about- But the there is one other factor to consider yes. though, and that is in primitive living, there's not somebody generally trying to kill you. Exactly. Which so changes the tactics. Yeah, you know, I, I think once you define, I'm in a war zone, I don't wanna meet the local people versus my, plane has crashed on an island, wouldn't it be great if there were some local people that can feed me? Your whole plan changes. The gear that you use, the skills that you use, whether or not you use fire or your MRE heater, all changes everything drastically. But once you grasp that as a situation, you start to uh, realize why a soldier carries a ruck and a primitive skills person carries a nice bojo kit and maybe a knife or not. You know, but also you can see kind of the bleed over. In my phone. <laughs> uh, nice. Okay. So to ask you a little bit, um, and to, to to talk a little bit about special forces versus conventional army. Conventional army. Um, I worked a long time ago as a forward observer. One of my jobs was to go out and find stuff for big artillery units to smash from above, and basically they roll through and destroy things. Think World War II. Special forces um, don't necessarily do that. Can you give me a little bit of an idea on how to explain that better? Um, that's not a bad explanation. I, I, there's a lot of myth to all this stuff. Yeah. Um, and let me say, there's some very, very skilled operators in the conventional forces that often gets overlooked. Yeah, it's not absolutely. so sexy. A lot of rangers. So, yeah. oftentimes, some of their skill sets may even be better than the unconventional forces. Mm -hmm. But the real difference is the number in which we operate, which modifies and, and adjusts our techniques. Instead of having a platoon, or, or a company or a larger force, you're independent. So you now have to operate totally off of your own devices, a small detachment of 12 people or less. So you become and the mechanic, the cook, the logistics person. Kind of one side, medic. know everything. Yeah. Your, your equipment, you don't have a lot of people to carry that, so equipment has to be critically analyzed. That's a lot of weight. Uh, everyone has to be specialized in what they know and then know everybody else's job too. So 
the the real mystique about special operations is is you are one to a handful Hanging of guys out. and you've got to be expertise in everything because you don't have a whole platoon to rely upon so I, I, I kind of gr grabbed a little bit of gear here um, and he's he's touched on a little bit and I'm gonna dust through it quickly uh, a lot of the conventional th there's not a lot of major differences between the conventional gear and the special forces gear if I were to narrow it down I would say weight weight Blade is probably is the track, biggest right? thing that I, I have seen um, this is some kit that I've got uh, this is some gray ghost and some tactical tailor kit this is one example of something you would see the Special Forces use more often than conventional. It has less Kevlar in the middle. It's got it's a plate carrier with a couple rows of mags for your M4, uh, a couple rows of mags for your pistol. There's real estate here for medical kit, radios, and uh, uh, water on the back. So it's really, really simple. It's your water, it's your ammunition, and it's lightweight. It's gonna protect less, but uh, again, uh, a conventional unit rolling through a valley is going to have a higher probability of IED attack than a special forces unit that flies in in a Chinook and runs to the location they're going to do their job and then leave. So that changes the way that you load out. Um, I also load a lot on my hips personally. Um, I screwed my back up a little bit in Afghanistan. I slipped a disc. So I have a lot of weight. A lot of my ammunition and my medical stuff is going to be in the form of a of a belt with suspenders that goes underneath this chest rig right here. I haven't got my uh, pistol attached to it, but your, your pistol is going to go right there. And the reason why I'm going to drop it on the floor. The reason why we do that essentially is is weight. The reason why I chose this is weight. Um, a lot of the weapon systems will be smaller uh, again because of weight and you know distribution there. So if we compare that to a civilian. Why would you need all of this stuff or this weight for a survival situation? I know a lot of a lot of people hit the zombie apocalypse. Obviously, there's no zombies. There's not going to be a zombie apocalypse, and it's it's in reference to the absolute worst case scenario. But I like to say that it's a little smarter to look at your area and say, I, I live in the Wasatch Front in Utah. What's the highest man-made probability? What's the highest natural probability? I think the highest natural probability is probably a big, massive earthquake. Um, am I going to need all this? No. I might like my pistol, my rifle with some ammo, maybe, until uh, stability happens, assuming that that's ever an issue. But I think a lot of the primitive skills survival set may serve me better in that situation. You know, uh, I, would, I, I would like to bring up the point that it really depends on your mission. And when we say that, that's not typically an outdoor wilderness survival term. Yeah. Uh, when you do that, you may go out there to practice living skills or just hanging out and, and having You're fun with hunting, your gun. Yeah. The difference in there with the military is we, ha we have a purpose for why we're there, uh, and which puts us inside of a confined time limit so we can uh, determine climate, puts us inside of environmental elements so we can tell we're in the desert, we're in the mountain, what kind of wildlife are there, what's the hostilities and the terrain. So when we pack, we have to pack very light. Like I say, we're carrying all this stuff. Maybe we'll have vehicles for additional support. But again, with this kind of equipment too, you can see we're making a trade-off between risk and mission accomplishment. So we need to be fast, flexible, move quickly. So we strip off the large conventional armor for plate carriers and maybe sometimes a lightweight uh, level three vest. <coughs> So we can move faster in and out of vehicles, up and down mountains, but we're much more vulnerable to ground fire because of that. So it's a trade-off, we want to accomplish that. When we get into, uh, again, a lot of these scenarios like preparing for an earthquake or the zombie apocalypse, that the danger there is, is it opens up this floodgate because there is no defined mission. Yeah. And we start, and I tell you, I'm the worst. Oh, we horror. pack gear. And I, yeah. I can survive easily. I just need a truck need with a, a trailer. Five homies <laughs> and a mule. Yeah. So, yeah. again, probably the big difference in what we're discussing is what, what is your ultimate purpose and how really, and the game really is, how light, how can you make your tools do the most functionality, get it as small as possible, and have the most flexibility to accomplish what you're trying to do. Exactly. So maybe some suggestions. I uh, let me ask. What would you suggest? Would you suggest uh, civilians to purchase a lot of military-grade gear for 
whatever eventual catastrophe it is that they decide to plan for. You know, here's some interesting things, and I have conflicts on this. Um, why military? Hey, it's overpriced. And again, we've heard all that all the time. But the reason why is this ruggedized. It's it is. meant for abuse yeah. and torture. And some of the civilian gear is coming up very well, but not necessarily in all cases. And it may be reinforcing around grommets or or extra plastic or metal here or there. But when you drop a weapon or drop something, uh, you understand why you pay that price. But here's the conflict we all have: is I don't have deep pockets to go out and buy very expensive military gear. I kind of go with this balanced approach where I use a variety, like. Like the tailoring stuff now, you can get at reasonable prices. And you can uh, get, the, the interesting thing about military too is you got the old stuff that's still from Vietnam era that is still bomber, oh. but it weighs so much. And I, I know, I, I remember one time when the new stretchy Gore-Tex came out and I was ice climbing and I walked past a tree and it poked a hole in my jacket and I'm like, are you seriously kidding me right now? So there's, the, I think you gotta find basically what you're saying is that line between it's super light and it's super flexible, but it falls apart versus I can throw it out of the back of a Chinook and roll it down the mountain and it's still gonna work. Well, but it weighs 80 pounds. I think the other thing too is consider exactly what you're using it for. <coughs> hey, if I'm gonna go climb the north face of Everest or something, I'm not taking military gear. In fact, you'll find that most military gear has converted <laughs> to, yeah. to civilian gear because it's specialized in its purpose. Yeah. But if I'm considering a shooting platform, mm -hmm. a click carrier or tactical gear of that, um, the civilian market copies Doesn't. the military, they do a crappy job of it. The, they don't specialize, it's right. And let me tell you, if you go to a gun show, it's a great example. Go do a walk around through there. And this stuff looks so awesome. I but mean, I, you, you use it for a week and the threads are coming undone and it can't hold the weight of your ammunition inside of the one little case. And Well, I'll give you a better example. And exactly why these things are built and retained the way they are is uh, I was an instructor once. We were tra training our support guys in SFBCCS, if you can look that up. And everyone brought out this first day, this bling, all the bling stuff. I call it the gun show stuff. And we told them, like, hey, you know, bring your issue stuff. But by the end of that day, we had them rolling around, changing platforms in the dirt. And every one of them, the next day, dropped all that gear, brought yeah. back. We found uh, magazines, weapons, just scattered. It, it, stuff looks correct, but it's not. If you want to go in this direction, this is why the military designed this this fashion. So inside this environment... You want to aim towards a military environment. If you're doing a mix and say doing some high-end mountaineering, you want to consider the private sector for that because they're more skilled at that. Mm -hmm. That kind of my general approach. Yeah. And cost. Cost is always a factor. Yeah, that's that, that's a double-edged sword. So this tactical tailor gear is some of the most prime quality military grade stuff you can get. Tactical tailored from Grey Ghost. It's robust. There's magnets inside of here to hold uh that's not magnetic. Anyway, there's there's magnets inside of here to hold your magazine, so you can go Glock or M9, and but you're going to spend money on it. Uh, it's it's going to run run you a higher amount of, of money. But also, if you want to get that ruggedness for bushcraft, you can go to the old Alice packs. Everyone and their dog knows about the Alice pack. It's just it's legendary. It works great. And even he mentioned earlier, and I can grab a, a ruck. Uh, the new the new military grade stuff looks a little bit more civilian. In fact, let me grab that real quick. Now that we got mountains of gear. All right, so I ran and grabbed a whole bunch of stuff. This is about an 80s era Alice pack. It's got an internal frame in it, which means I can put a boat ton uh, of gear on it. And, yeah, ex external. External frame, which means I can put a boat ton of gear on it. These are so robust. This, this backpack's purpose is for when I jump with the military, to get thrown out of the back of the plane with me, drug across the ground as I land in my parachute. That's why that's where the rubber band was from. So that's why I have this pack. Uh, another pro about it is it gives you aeration space on your back. That's also a con if you don't have a lot of back support. So it's kind of like give some, get some. But they carry heavy objects, heavy weight loads very well. They push it off the hip and just load the shoulder and the hip properly. So they work great. So this is kind of the old school gold standard, post -Viet Vietnam, prior to, I, I want to say this is like an 80s. Well, uh, and I have to admit my bias here. Yeah. I entered the military with the Alice, yeah, and, and so I've gone I. through a variety, and I'll always <coughs> swear by the Alice. 
there are some inconveniences and it's a pain in the butt in some yeah. cases but this rucksack is I consider the best yeah that thing is old as my military career and since and they're old and cheap you yeah. can find this stuff relatively like 60 bucks profit. I think you can get from one of these and the, the idea about this too the thing about it, especially with surplus is 20 bucks maybe great backpack you could buy your family all yeah. and if you know what if you lose this thing it burns up in a fire you're gonna it's like, yourself to sleep okay yeah. you do in a nice commercial bag over a hundred dollars yeah no nah, you you're so stressing. I have two bags here this is the seek outside ultralight backpack and this is the tactical tailors brand new um tahoma please correct me if i'm wrong on that but if you notice it's kind of got the best of both worlds well, we were talking about that earlier it's got the frame this is the malice frame it's got the uh the the belt pat webbing or the the padding on the belt it's got uh padding up top but not down low that way it has cushioning without water retention um, it's got all the military good stuff and it looks like minus the color this looks just like a, a Kelty pack it's got the pockets on the side it's got these nice access zip zippers right down the middle um, it's got the whatever this thing did is the kind of detachable button yeah isn't it? in the yeah, uh, it could other be system. it's got the, uh, the pockets there and then it's got the military closure up top which is one and then two that locks down on itself. So it's kind of a hybrid between all of the good things that you see in the military with its ability to carry heavy loads with the frame and everything, and its ruggedness with these civilian designs, like access to the gear in the bottom with the dual zipper, so I can get down in here and pull something out without digging and through my whole bag. That's probably the biggest deficiency with yeah. the Alice pack. <clears throat> you gotta dig and it you got out. that one thing at the bottom, and you gotta gut that whole thing out, and it's dark, cold, and you can't make a noise. Exactly. <laughs> so fun. this is the military taking on some of this, the wisdom of the civilian, and this one over here is the civilian taking on some of the wisdom of the military. Um, this is an ultralight bag that I demoed up in the winters. I use this a lot for uh, deer hunting. It's got the sail cloth, so it's really lightweight, um, rip stuff. But how much do you think that whole thing weighs? Oh, three or four pounds. Yeah, three or four pounds. The majority of the weight, I dare say, is coming from this a a attached bag I added and from my pistol setup on the other side. But this is full military ultralight that has replicated that frame uh i'm sorry full civilian ultralight that's replicating some of the of the military attributes of the frame externally here the multi-cam color um so it's kind of the best of both worlds now if i'm going to go do a military function of some sort i'm coming to do some military class or something i'm going to use this military ruck because this ultralight bag while it's nice to have that lightweight it's not going to hold up but if I'm going elk hunting, I'm bringing this puppy because that's less weight that I have to carry um, in the bag itself, and it just kind of it kind of flows from full military, military civilian, full civilian, copy and military, and back and forth depending on what you're looking for. So, what would you suggest your average person, your average civilian, look at as far as buying this kind of gear for natural disasters? Like, talk a little bit about this guy right here. Well, you know, I, 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 I think, I don't know what a lot of your subscribers consider um, important and what the mindset is. But I'm for, me, guess. for me, I'll tell you, yeah. cost. Cost, cost always weighs on my mind. And I'm not opposed to spending large amounts of money for the proper gear, mm. but I want to have a lot of stuff. I, I hate to say that because in the background I have boxes and boxes of stuff. Yeah. And this is a military mindset too. We have boxes and tons of very cool gear. And then when we decide what we're going to do, we select from that. Mm -hmm. To do that as a, a, a civilian, as a hobby, as a money. backdoor survivalist, it costs a large amount of money. If you have that flexibility, that's great. And as you build your stuff up, unfortunately, I should have brought this too because I have boxes and boxes of stuff I bought and I learned that that, that was totally junk purchase. Yeah. Holsters, bags, this, flashlights, that's all. It's like, oh, that's a good example yeah. of what not to buy. So that's kind of the catch. Now. The great and example I, when we start out with bagging and stuff too. I think that's why a lot of people watch these videos is they can come in and say, if I'm going to get a shooter kit, where should I go? If I'm going to get a civilian bug out bag, where should I go? So that you guys can learn from our mistakes. Because I, 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 brought a, I brought a Condor bag to Afghanistan. 
it died quick. <laughs> well, and, and that's like it, I say, it's a great example, but <coughs> I can it's show a you a long time ago of mine. I can show a lot of expenditure I put in there to test drive equipment, only to find out that. It was junk. It was not a good idea. But a great idea about this, again, if you're going to be camping a lot and you've got a versatility and you don't want to necessarily have the rough look of the, of the as I'm pointing to this, the military style, yeah. you can find some decent, very expensive and very cheap civilian bags. Mm -hmm. But if you're really playing out there in the woods, you're around smoky fires mm -hmm. and a lot of hazards, a lot of throwing this up and down hills, this is a great buy. And like I say, I don't know the actual cost. If you look on this. Side, maybe 20 to 50 bucks. We have a we have an Army Navy surplus store very close to my house. It's a little overpriced. These rugs are around about 60 bucks. And compared to a civilian bag, which may be upwards of 300 dollars. Uh, this ultralight one is 385, 425, if I remember right. It's really, really expensive. And it's largely because of the cloth that they're using in that. So. Now, here's where we get into all this new mindset, and we got these these bug out bags and stuff like that. And I'll tell you what, they could start off with a hip belt, really. In all yeah. honesty, depending on what you're With a knife, it's like a knife. Mine always ends up morphing into multiple suitcases. Yeah. <laughs> Not really quite the bug out. Yeah. Um, people would, in general, probably consider this. This is a small. Mm -hmm. This Alice comes in three sizes, small, medium, and large. The large is a little bit longer, has bigger pockets. Up medium here. is about this size, large is kind of Big. Yeah, it's kind of big around. Uh, but they all go off the same frame. This would probably make a, a reasonably nice uh, yeah, bug out bag, great, but good trunk bag. I was gonna say yeah. good trunk bag, but 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 then you got this frame and all this stuff. It makes it a little awkward. Then you can go this route. Um, who is this by? I should know. That's Black Hawk. There's a variety of them that make this now. This is really nice. They've integrated some different items in here with pouches. And uh, I think with this one too, they even, for military people, rigged it up so it can be airdrop as a parachute. That's nice. This is all really cool stuff you're going to use that kind of bling in the civilian world. might look nice to lash this down and a variety of things. Do you need that? No. This has a soft frame. It's really not really a frame per se. But you, but, will, but you can pack this thing up. Yeah. The other thing too about this is this color is military appropriate, but it's also civilian appropriate. It's just a green bag. I think OD green, personally, is the best color that I've ever seen for an urban or backcountry bug out that happens to be, you, you happen to have both needs, right? Can it's I, green, can I but it doesn't look that? full militant. Yeah, yeah, you know, can I walk through the mall wearing that backpack without thinking I'm com completely full military, because you never go full retard. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. You have to consider yeah. the just like we talked about the mission. So if, if in fact you're packing for um, an earthquake scenario, yeah. you want something um, that's robust. You, you want like a hobo. Yeah, you want to be able to move and have gear, but you don't necessarily want to look like an armed combatant because again, exactly. consider the fact that it may be looters or other activities like that. If you look too like faggy, like the, if I can say that yeah. term with pink or something, yeah. you're gonna set yourself up as a target. Conversely though, if you look for militant with plate carriers and that, yeah. you might be engaged as people as maybe a looter or something. So this is a nice blend where it's rugged, it's more surplus if you will, it's not really harassing, whereas that, so you kind of Yeah, if I, if I throw, throw my full kit on, you know, walking downtown Salt Lake with one of these guys on, yeah, it, it raises questions. It looks a little hazardous, <laughs> a little suspicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another, color, time, another color to consider is just going with black if you want a full neutral. If you really want some gear like this, and it's cold enough, you can throw a jacket over this. Mm -hmm. There, there are ways to do that. It just depends on the situation. But again, I think the biggest thing too is your flexibility, and if you have the money. And you really want to invest in something really rugged and nice. These kinds of equipments here are, are awesome. They'll last your whole life. Um, if you're, again, it's a great example too with some bug out bags for my family in case we had a little natural disaster. I took old backpacks and stuff that was kind of ratty, yeah. old camping gear, because once I pack them up, I'm never really going to use them again. Yeah. And again, I went to a local like uh, thrift store to buy my kid because he's growing now. And every year, everything's changed. He'll never wear this stuff because it's vacuum sealed and packed. So I went and bought some low end stuff with just sweats and basic stuff to overcome that cost. Now for me, I, I'm probably not going to grow much more. 
Uh, oh, so I went and bought nicer and stuff. Yeah. So my rain equipment, my thermal protection is pretty high end because I know it's going to fit me and I'm going to have it for a long, long time. Cool. This kind of consideration. That's stuff to think about. Um, so before we go, he, we, we're going to do some future videos. They're going to get into these topics a little bit more in depth. So we want to get a little bit of feedback from you on what you want us to cover. Obviously, my channel has a lot of bushcraft and survival. I'm going to continue to do that because I really enjoy it. I'm starting to cover some more of the military stuff, which I initially wasn't too sure about covering, but I've done it for such a long time. I think it's something I need to start covering. Um, so we want to give you some ideas uh, of some videos that we can do in the future. Maybe we'll do them all. Maybe we'll just do a couple. Um, so what are some things that we can show the the users like some of the medical and, and gun making and stuff. Well, you know what I, I I kind of like to see a lot of what we did from the military as this bridge in the civilian market. Mm. What some of the stuff we do is inappropriate and probably would bore the heck out of you. It's mm. not that cool. But there's a lot of skill sets that are very applicable uh, for a variety of situations. From like we say, natural disasters, even just a family camping, yeah. all the way out to the the ubiquitous. Zombie apocalypse. Yeah. So, but in there, but my, part of my interest and some of the things that I got involved with, I think is also just a lot of viewer interest too. So I'm quite curious to see if people would like to go in depth with that. Um, my company, I have a firearms company. We're an NFA company, so we we uh, deal with so short barreled. That means National Firearms Act, because I know Thank someone's going to ask. And basically, that is. This is all the controlled weapons, yeah. like short barrel weapons, the shotgun, suppression equipment, automatic weapons, stuff like that. And also dealing with the, and I don't even use that term, don't buy off on this assault weapon, the AR-15 yeah. platform. Uh, this is not an assault weapon. This is my defense rifle. It's exactly the same as an assault rifle, only I have yet to assault anyone with it, and I never will. So, yeah. yeah this is a civilian sporter rifle. Yeah. And uh, because I, we're having I, all I this with this. Against. This is my backpacking rifle. I do sports, uh, sporting stuff with it. I do military type training with it. Um, all of the above because this gun just works for everything. But here's the market uh, that's coming to speed and, and there's a lot of people out there getting involved with this. And, and, and my point is, is now people are spending bling money, heavy, heavy money on these firearms. And if that's what you're into, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. A, a conversation I had with some of my other military friends, they were all looking at these high-end, uh, like Troy or something, mm -hmm. high-end firearms, they're going to drop about 1500 bucks. I'm excellent. Poor. I built this one from scratch. See, yeah, excellent uh, weapon. I, I, one month I bought a trigger kit. One month I bought a, a sight. One month I bought a bolt carrier group. So... My argument with them is, is, is that's a nice, nice weapon. But I can put three very, very good weapons together for the price you're spending on that. If that's your interest, that's great. But as, as a survivalist, I'd rather have my weapon I shoot and have two others to the side. I can let friends shoot them. I could just go out and bury them. For you me. can trade them if that becomes an issue and you know, all sorts of stuff. So. But as we get into that, too, this is a growing trend. And I tell you, it's, it's really exciting. But now instead of taking, and taking these platforms and blinging them out, um, learn how to build them yourself. Become the ultimate manufacturer. You as an individual, as long as you're allowed to in your state and you're allowed to possess firearms. Obey the laws. I don't want to hear there you any, go. any contrary. And I, and I have a strong belief in that. You don't want to set yourself up for any kind of recourse. Yeah. And you don't need to. You are allowed to manufacture your own weapons for your own use, as long as they conform to the law and uh, you have fun doing it, yeah. yeah. So again, here's a concept. Some of you may be familiar, if not, go out and Google it. Or if you'd like, we could entertain this better. But the 80% market, this is a thriving market. Now you're gonna hear a lot about this in the future if you're not already aware of it. But up to a certain point in the manufacturing, this is considered a piece of aluminum in this case. Yeah, this Completely is basically nothing. a chunk of aluminum. There's no center or any of this stuff here. This, that hasn't been finished to the level that the ATF considers a firearm. So you can buy this, and if you don't have the sophisticated milling equipment, you can buy it in this configuration and make the finishing cuts with not that much effort, with some minimal machining, depending is, on the refinement. You so can prepare them. most people should know what this is, but if you look, this is just that lower receiver right there for that gun that has not been finished yet. So, okay. so anyway, this turns into that. <coughs> Throw some paint on there, bam, you got your air 15. You got this guy right here. The cool thing is, you know what, if you get into this, you, you, you know your gun now. You know your gun 
Not even to what parts are in it, but actually even the dimensions of what it is. Uh, here's another example. This was about 24 hours ago a flat piece of metal. Now there's the receiver for an AK-47, which we'll, we're going to be in my company. We're finding this out to do the full build on in a series of videos. So people are interested in that. Uh, this is a variety too. 1911s, very popular, very pricey. Wow, man, I think the average, they're coming down in the low grade, like 600 But like my Kimber, I mean, you're, you're $1,200 yeah. into that gun. They're nice. I mean, I can tell you this gun is a little bit more finicky, but it's nothing you can't do with a lot of basic hand tools and some small machinery. But this frame also started from the 80%. Now this is fully constructed. In fact, I just fired this and I stripped this down now because it's going to go to cleaning and painting. So this is an easy home project. But the whole idea is why rely upon somebody else when you can do this for yourself. Have fun doing it too. So are you guys interested in seeing these type of videos? Yeah. I assume so, and we'll probably end up doing this as well. Press um, A for yes. Yes, I'll say it for yes. Leave comments in the bottom. And uh, medical. Let's, let's talk about um, that real quick. Yes. <clears throat> I, as I introduce myself, I also have 18 Delta background experience. Um, that is a uh, special, special forces medic. medic. The irony with that, and it again, <coughs> take years to go and explain that course in detail, but the difference there is, again, you may go to the EMT school, I, I'm an EMT, um, but this takes you to a whole different mindset. Um, the program shifted in a variety of ways over the years, but the idea is now you're independent. You don't have a 911 system and you've got to do patient care. You're no longer contracting your security or your personal medical security, if you will, to other people. You can just take care of it yourself. So this is not a big uh, explanation. It's kind of an enticement to see if people are interested. Just like packing your tactical gear, wow, now you'll see when you go to these little trade shows and that, more and more of this stuff. And I hate to say that because they put a lot of, I think, garbage in these kits. They put a lot of them effort into it initially from an untrained perspective and fill it with a lot of cheap Chinese crap that doesn't work. But they don't know well, any better. So. I'm not trying to rip on these people. They just don't know what they're doing. Oftentimes, sometimes you do get, you do get very well trained people. Um, as an example, the IFAC kit that I showed in my active shooter video, I got that from another 18 Delta friend of mine back east. So, so here's some ideas. When you do want to buy a kit or actually make a kit that's going to be functional. A lot of people, unfortunately, don't have the background. They go and buy this very nicely packaged thing. It's full of junk. They're you never going to get to what you really need. If they product. do, usually it's for Band-Aid Owies, and then that'll work. But when then you want to get into real issues, you find yourself where you don't want to be. So part of this will be same thing with this. What do you want to buy, and how do you want to pack it? And that comes in a variety of ways. What kind of gear works? What kind of gear doesn't? We could talk about a variety of techniques, but also some of the other stuff is too about what to buy in bulk, how to how, how to, to set it the out. bags up, and how to set stuff up. I know on mine, I have a blood section, I have an airway section. Um, at least for my brain, that's one way to learn. And I don't want to use this as an example because yeah. this is not packed out. My yeah. actual bag I didn't bring, yeah. which is fully loaded. But to give you an example too, uh, and again, the idea of this is I, I think a lot of people probably think. Or they don't even see this because it's not common in the market. Well, they haven't been in a situation where they've had to actually yeah. apply uh, critical medicine. Right, and I'm not going to say, just like following the laws of firearms, you this stuff isn't magic. You still have to get trained. But I'll give you some reasons on why that is. And the most significant one is, for instance, here. This is some advanced business here. And this is airway management. And this is going all the way from simple airway replacements the full tracheotomies and the full uh, yeah, which is beyond my endotracheal yeah. involvement is gets nasty. I'm if not going to have that education. Wouldn't you want someone with that type of education to be on your your survival team? But I'll give you an even better example. Others, yeah. Is for instance in an urban environment, what if all of a sudden we had an, an earthquake of some size? Mm -hmm. Now the interesting There's thing way is way more victims than there is medical professional. I may not have the skill sets to do all this. Let's hit this real quick. Yeah. Somebody else might. Correct. Somebody else so, might. Just a few days ago, there's 50 people shot in Florida. In Florida, horrible, horrible accident. I don't condone that whatsoever. But what is going to be more important directly after this incident, this type of gear or this type of gear? Oftentimes, people get wrapped up in getting the guns. Which, hey, I'm pro gun. I don't know if you could tell that, because that is the quickest, most effective response to an active shooter is bullets. 
Then after that situation, what do you need to do next? Oftentimes people don't look past that bullet phase to the medical phase. I dare say the most important thing right after that incident was that people had individual and advanced first aid kits so that they could deal with stopping the bleeding and stabilize them until the hospital, which I'm sure was overwhelmed, was able to catch up with all of the influx of patients. Well, and that's a great example, too, of what to buy, what not. And again, it's, it's ABCs. If you learn that from Boy Scout forward, it's airway, airway breathing, breathing circulation. circulation. Now, the difference is, is I'm a Boy Scout. I may know CPR. Um, I may have maybe a pocket filter to put over that, like a lot of people carry, in case somebody goes down in your office. But if I take that ABCs now to somebody to a mess casually shooting 50 people, and the, now I'm doing tourniquets. Doctors are no good without gear. Right? If you have this gear and you have someone with the medical the background that can, that can use it, now suddenly they've got more gloves and more IVs and more options than they did before when they're just trying to use their fingers. Well, yeah, like I say, too, you, some knowledge, you know, you gotta, you got to gauge that. But at the same time, you, you can gain that knowledge to have any equipment. But here's the difference is, is everyone's pretty much been contained. And, and maybe, uh, like I've arrived at car, scene, car accident scenes, you know what, still, in most cases, you've got a 10 minute or less response time, mm -hmm. you got professionals coming, you're doing a lot of stability. But now, if, say for instance, you're out in the back country, and yeah. somebody's rolled a four wheel vehicle. And you drive don't have vehicle. communications until you get to the other side of the hill, or exactly. your phone doesn't work. And now, whatever. let's say, and I'm not gonna even put the scare factor, of, let's say that's your son or daughter in the car, but let's say it's a bystander, and now that face has crushed their jaw, and now we've gotta do some complex thing to save their airway, which is a simple maneuver and it's a life or death thing just to let them have air into their body. Let them breathe. Yeah. But you won't find that kind of tooling from a lot of the junk you're buying down there. No. The store. I just, so this yeah. would be a conversation about what, and you can just see what an 18 Delta, what their approach to that would be. You can see if you like it or not, what the technique, what a, what a real med kit should look like versus what, unfortunately, I hate to say this, people are packaging now and I think it's just, just very dangerously naive. Exactly. Okay, so. If you've got questions for James or me, leave them down in the discussion comment. If you want to know about any of this gear, ask me. I'll stick links in the bottom. I'll try to remember to stick the link to that IFAC video that's oh, on my channel. Oh, one other fun. One more. Oh, let's see. This. Here's the other side. Yeah, These are definitely what I talk about. The other thing I want to introduce people to, though, and again, I have to have to strongly recommend this is for academic purposes only. This is about making uh, suppression. And this is an avenue we've been playing with just on improvised suppression. Let me cover this real quick too. Silencer is a horrible word for a suppressor. It doesn't make anything silent. It makes it quieter so that it doesn't damage your ears and it sounds a little bit different. There's no real such thing as making it silent. That's a good okay. example and a lot of people expect that. Um, this is a variety uh, of different phases of manufacturing. This is stuff you can do at home if you do it correctly. And you can make this at home. To do it. Don't even start or, this without the license. Or again, yeah. like you say, if you file a Form 1, yeah. if you want to have the knowledge to do that, that's great. If you want to actually do it, you can improvise your own. You can manufacture your own. You just have to go through the proper paperwork and get that done. In fact, I'd recommend that if you've got the interest in it, mm -hmm. make it yourself. See how it works. Once the ATF approves your Form 1, you're licensed to manufacture that item. Here's some examples where I started out with it. I was really intrigued. <coughs> Again, my ideas with this being a special forces soldier was not only what you can buy on the market, but if you're not available to the market and you have to improvise that, what are you capable? How do you really get this stuff done? Yeah. And the first one I found of interest, and I believe it came, and I want to give the credit to SD Tactical, um, was this. I've modified this a little bit, but this was designed off of a mag light, and it was awesome. improvised by freeze plugs from the local hardware store, and this. The performance on this is incredible, and this is cheap. In fact, the original concept still allows the mag light head and base to come on there that conceals this bay in your vehicle, so it wouldn't even be recognized as a suppressor. That's cool. Fascinating design, but the whole idea is if I had to improvise something. Uh, all the way up to making more, this is for a 300 black, at it's unfinished. Uh, how do you do the difference between, this was for a larger mag light, um, different ideas, and again, the concept in here, we should also discuss a variety of this stuff. So, improvising from automobile freeze plugs, which makes a nice concave dish in there. And also, the more commercial thing, here's the unfinished K baffle. It's common in a lot. I don't have a monocore example. But now you go and buy these commercials that are fully available if you want a fully finished one. I highly recommend you do it. They're fun. 
But if you want to see what the guts are and how you can make yeah, them, maybe we can do a video on how you this can all see works. what the process looks like too. So yeah. this is exciting. Oh, I'm I'm all about it. I'm still to play with stuff. All right, guys. Questions in the comment section. I'll leave links down here below. If you have any questions for him, leave them down there as well. And uh, thank you for watching T Jack Survival. Thanks for coming over and chatting. Thanks for having me. All right.